what we do here is we get into the word and today we're going to be in Galatians chapter 3, a very powerful text that we're going to be studying out. What do we see here? If you want to know an outline, it, it talks about the spirit received by faith, not works of the law. He talks about Abraham's faith and the promise that God made to us through Abraham's faith. He talks about the curse of the law. He literally uses this phrase curse, that those under the law are under a curse. And then he talks about the law versus the promise, sons, that we are heirs through faith. This is a very powerful text. Chapter 3, Paul, uh, in, in Galatians chapter 3, really emphasizes the centrality of faith that is found in Christ for salvation. Very powerful, contrasting that with the law. And this is uh, a point of great contention in the first century because you've got a history, a lineage of 1,500 years of Judaism and all that was associated with this, and now a massive transition into faith in Christ. That Christ can fulfill all that God has intended for us in salvation through faith in Christ. Boy, and Paul, as he writes this letter to the Galatians, we've talked about this, he is addressing those that he called Judaizers or those from the circumcision group that are causing chaos in Christianity by saying you must adhere to the law in order to be saved, the law and Christ. And Paul calls this a false teaching. And so as we pick up where we pretty much left off yesterday in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7, it says, understand then that those who have faith are what? Children of Abraham. And we talked about the importance of that. Understanding to be a child of Abraham means you have you are in line with the promise of God that all would be blessed through faith, through the same kind of faith that Abraham exercised. Verse 8, scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. Well, what is he saying? He's saying that this was a prophecy. You know, a lot of times we... Uh, we look at prophecy and we think that it's it's so clear in it. Some are very clear and some are not. And what Paul is revealing to us is that in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God saying all nations will be blessed through him, speaking of Abraham, was a prophecy foretelling the gospel in advance. You know, so we gain insight into prophecy. Allow the scholar of the scriptures, allow the apostle to give us definition of prophecy in the Old Testament. So easily people dismiss when you quote these passages as prophecy. They quickly go, oh, well, that doesn't mean that. Well, they are arguing against a scholar in the first century. They are arguing against a gentleman that probably has memorized most of the Old Testament. They are arguing against one that is appointed by Jesus himself and has interaction with Peter, James, and John. He is in cahoots with those in the first century that are eyewitnesses to the life of Jesus. Not only that, miraculous signs and wonders accompanied him. And he is discoursing on the Old Testament scriptures, giving us insight into what the prophecies were and their fulfillment in Christ. So if anyone, if anyone is taking up against uh, uh, this particular teaching, they are teaching up against some, someone that is incredibly connected to God, incredibly connected to Peter, James, and John, and incredibly insightful and scholarly of the Old Testament. What gives anyone today credentials that far supersede the Apostle Paul? That, boy, that's a strong argument for someone to come up and combat what he's teaching. They need to be silent and let the prophet speak. Verse 9, so those who rely on faith, what does he say? Are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Wow, very powerful here. 
in what he's laying out. So now we're going to get into verse 10. Uh, this is where we ended yesterday. It says, for all who rely on what? The works of the law are under a curse. Now, what I want you to understand here is that Paul is not saying anyone who does the work or actually participates in the works of the law, you know, he's not saying that. What he's saying is all who rely on it, rely on it for what? For righteousness, for justification, for being right with God, for not being under a curse. If you are relying on that, the law, under the law, you are under a curse. Wow. This is very, very powerful here. You know, when you find yourself in a debate or conversation with someone today, and they're telling you, you have to adhere to whether it be the Sabbath, food restriction, circumcision, or any of the festivals in the law. If, if they're trying to convince you, you have to do this for righteousness or for justification, they are a lie. They are teaching false doctrine. They are not a Christian. They are not. Paul calls them in Galatians chapter 2 a false believer. They are not in line with what God teaches in the word. And you need to be confident of that because this is what Paul is saying. He says, for all who rely on the law are under a curse. And then the interesting thing here, he quotes in the Old Testament. Notice what he says. And he says, as it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Well, why is he saying, well, wait a second. He's saying cursed is anyone who doesn't continue to do everything in the book of the law. Well, why is he saying he's getting from Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 26, because all of them knew it was impossible to do everything in the law. You had what? The Ten Commandments, but then you had 613 different commands that were associated with the book of the law, and no one could fulfill them. No, they, they, they always fell short in these. And so what he's saying is, unless you're per perfect in all of this, you are under a curse. And he says it clearly states that in Deuteronomy chapter 27. Very, very powerful statement here in Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. And, and what is he saying? Verse 11, he says, clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God. Wow. No one is justified who relies on the law before God, because the righteous will live by how? Faith. And he quotes Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2. Uh, this is one of the minor prophets during a very dismal time where the temple had been destroyed. So you, you, the context of this is very powerful. And what does he say in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4? See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his what? Faithfulness. It's all about faith. This is powerful. It always been about faith. When God called Abraham, the law was not instituted. What was it about? Faith. When God called Noah, what was it about? It was about being faithful to the call of God. It was always about faith. And you go, well, what, well, what is this law? We're going to get to that. We are going to get to that in this letter. But understand that you cannot merge the two, faith in Christ and being faithful to the law, as justification. He goes on, verse 12, watch what he says. He says, the law is not based on faith. Wow, very powerful. What is he saying? He's even getting more specific about the contrast of the law and the contrast of faith in Christ. And what does he say? The law is not based on faith. On the contrary. It says the person who does these things will live by them. And he's quoting text, just saying that this is not about faithfulness. It's about duty. It's not about 
uh, uh, faithfulness that we find in Christ. And he's quoting that from Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5. Verse 13 of Galatians chapter 3. What does he say? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. There was a curse under the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Now, a lot of times people say, well, man, why is the law a curse? Well, one, the Bible teaches that. Um, and, and then the other part of this is think about what's in the law. You know, how many times have I gotten on this form and there have been naysayers of the Bible, atheists, uh, rejecters of God, and they get on. And what's the first thing they want to talk about? Some of the things that are in the law, the treatment of women, the, uh, uh, the treatment of slaves, the, the uh, management of slaves, all these things are in the law. So when we read something that says, cursed is everyone under the law, we should not be surprised. We should not be surprised that God is saying that adherence to the law does not bring forth justification. Not only does it not bring forth justification, it does not bring forth righteousness. It is immoral. It is wrong. It is not what God intended. So we should not. So the idea that you have Christians arguing for support of the law is contrary to what everything that we see so clearly is written out here in this letter to the Galatians. And this is why Paul says anyone under the law is under a curse. So when people come to me and talk about the law and they say, see, God is, is perpetuating uh, sex uh, 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 to slaves or slavery and all this, I just go, no, God clearly says anyone under the law is under a curse. So I, I, I got no qualms with that debate. I, I'm going to call it what it is. Anyone under the law is under a curse. So when you find somebody who calls himself a Christian and is promoting the law, it's contrary to Christ's likeness. It's contrary to what God has called us to. God is not calling us to live under a curse. Wow. That is, you know, this is a great text to help those that are really messed up with this subject matter. You follow what I'm saying? This is it. God didn't say what a word of any of those books. It's all hearsay. This, you know, I, again, you get people that make these statements because they don't see the connection between God and mankind through the Bible narrative, right? You, they, they, they don't see it. All they see is that they don't like certain teachings in the Bible and they reject it, or they don't like those that follow the Bible, so therefore they reject it without studying out the biblical text. You're telling me for 1,500 years, there is no way there is any kind of conspiracy or hearsay when you see the consistency of those that were faithful in God and the outcome of the way of their life. Very profound in every way. And when you read like Galatians here, and Paul is talking to about 10 churches in a particular area, and he's discoursing on the history of God's word and God's people, boy, this is profound to see. This is not some hearsay. This is reliable history that, that spans 1,500 years at the time of Paul, documented and written and passed down from generation to generation, from life to life, from faithful to faithful, and boy, is it powerful. It is so profound in its writings and its outcome, and man, the adherers are listening to this and gaining insight into God. And the thing that is so profound with all of this, Paul writes earlier in the text, he says, you saw with your own eyes that Jesus was clearly crucified. These individuals embarked in not hearsay of Jesus Christ, but they were participants in seeing the outcome of the way of Christ's life, the reality of Jesus living, his teaching, and the impact that he had on the community 
and the Roman Empire was profoundly known by those in the first century. This was not conjecture. This was not some mythological story. These individuals understood the reality of Christ and the reality of his impact. And Paul is writing about it. And you don't write to a group and say that Jesus was clearly portrayed as crucified in your eyes. You don't write that to people. And them not go, no, we've never seen him. We know nothing about him. That would be a foolish statement to write. But he wrote it because it was true. And the hearers that read it understood it to be true. And they had to make a decision of faith. For the naysayers that speak today about the Bible being hearsay, they have no historical evidence for that to be true. They have zero evidence for that statement, and it's based on the fact that they don't like the teachings of the Bible. They don't like how Christians live hypocritical lives, or maybe they hate the institution of religion, so they reject the scriptures without studying them themselves and seeing the truth that is found in the Bible. Whoa, people, powerful. So we get into this. What does he say in verse 13? Galatians chapter 3, Christ redeemed us from what? The curse of the law. Come on, Tammy. Come on. Give me that swan. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. By what? Now watch this. By becoming a curse for us. Now he's going to give us more prophecy here. He says, for it is written, cursed is everyone hung on a pole. Now a pole. This is powerful because Paul, I mean, in these short verses, he's got like three major passages, uh, in Deut two in Deuteronomy, one in Habitat, uh, and one uh, in Genesis. He, oh, so it's actually three, uh, ma four major passages of prophecy about the forecoming of Jesus. And you got to understand this. You're talking five, 800 years, a thousand years prior to the events, God is talking about what is going to happen literally this weekend? This weekend. Do you understand? Not only this weekend, today on Good Friday. And watch what he says in Deuteronomy chapter 21. He says, you must not leave the body hanging on a pole overnight. This is why they had to take Jesus down after the death, because they understood from Deuteronomy that a dead person on the pole on this night, Passover, would curse the land. He says, be sure to bury it that same day, because anyone who is hung on a pole is under what? God's curse. You must not desecrate the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. This is Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. Are you kidding me? I mean, you're talking a thousand years prior to these events? What is happening? God is foretelling about what? Christ being crucified. And Paul is saying, here it is. In Deuteronomy, God foretold that anyone that dies on a pole is under a curse. Wow. Do you understand what's going on here? It's being foretold in Deuteronomy about what was going to happen as far as our justification through faith in Christ. Why? Because Christ is going to become a curse. When is he going to become a curse? On the tree. Wow. Anyone that is hung on a pole is under a curse. Very, very powerful in every way. In Acts chapter 5, verse 30, what does the writer say? It says, the God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by what? Hanging him on a cross. These accusations, these statements are proof texts for those that he wrote to. If this guy was lying when he wrote this to these individuals, they would have seen this as a fraud. They would have seen this as a, a not a truth. It is actually written documentation in the first century between a dialogue of individuals that were eyewitnesses to the events. If you write something and uh, two individuals and you're saying to them something that took place when they were there, they will either validate or reject what you are saying. And because you don't like that, 
doesn't mean you can reject it. Paul was a was in connection with Peter, James, and John. He writes this to his hearers. If Paul was lying, the fraud of his statements would have been revealed because they were all there in the first century. And you can validate what one is saying as truth or a lie because it all took place in the first century. And this is where people just don't know their history and they're mad. They're angry about the reality of the truth of the documents. And here's the reality. In Galatians, you can't find a scholar that has a PhD in antiquity, writings of antiquity, that will say Galatians was not written some 20 years after the resurrection, nor that it wasn't written by the Apostle Paul. They will tell you emphatically, this is an authentic document that is written by the proposed writer, Apostle Paul, and it's written some 20 years after the resurrection. It is authenticated, both Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Corinthians, and these are all early writings, letters, and in these letters, there's detailed information about Paul working with Peter, James, and John, who were eyewitnesses to the entire life of Jesus. And even here in Galatians, Paul says, you've seen with your own eyes that Jesus was clearly crucified. You don't write that to a group of people if it is a lie, because if it's a lie, no one will hold it in high regard. Yet this letter was held in high regard and copied over thousands and thousands of times because it was true. And because you don't like that doesn't mean you can reject it. You have to bring forth evidence to the contrary to hold to your conclusion. I am bringing you evidence that this is true. You have brought forth zero evidence except conjecture. Wow. Wow. No, that's not true. The earliest copies of manuscripts that we have come in the um, uh, second century. We have scraps. We have fragments. The third century. What do we have? We have over 2.3 million pages, million pages of copies of the First Testament. How do we know these are written in the First Testament? See, you don't have an education in this. Let me educate you. How do we know when these documents are written? Why do the uh, uh, the scholars of antiquity say that this, this letter, Galatians, was written 20 years after Jesus? How do they know that? They know it by the writing style. See, they look at it in, in different ways. The writing styles, the grammar, that's how they look at it and confirm. It's kind of like if I said to you, right on, soul brother, you know exactly what decade I'm coming from. If I'm writing a letter and saying, right on, soul brother, number one, you know exactly what decade I'm talking about. If I'm talking about wearing a members only jacket, you know exactly what decade I'm talking about. You know, one is from the 70s, the other is from the 80s, and that is how they're able to determine when these letters are written. These are atheistic scholars that will tell you this. This is how we know. Let me tell you something. Speak the truth. If you don't like what's in the Bible, I'm cool with that. But don't make up stuff about the Bible that is not true to support your rejection of the teaching. The actual scholarship that is out there says emphatically that Galatians was written 20 years after the death of Jesus. So step off with an analogy or a statement that is not false or not backed up by evidence. What I'm bringing to you is evidence. I'm not giving you my opinion. I'm not giving you what I understand. I'm telling you what scholarship has confirmed in the Bible. Galatians, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, 1st Thessalonians, Philippians. These are all written by the Apostle Paul and written in the first century dating as early as 15 years after the resurrection of Jesus. Let me tell you something. You can take that to the bank. And because it is written, I'm not saying that it means Jesus is the Son of God. But what I am saying is it is written 15 to 20 years after the things that took place with Jesus. And when you look at that, then you investigate what is written. And you go, how is it that this man can make these claims to these individuals that could verify 
or deny what he did because they could talk to the individuals that were still alive. Boy, that's a lot of evidence. You got to come strong or don't come at all. You have to come strong or don't come at all. And so when you read this, boy, it's compelling for me. Because what is Paul saying? Let me tell you something. Jesus became a curse for us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Woo, boy, I'm telling you, man. Listen, I get it. We come here every morning. We get into the word of God. That's what we do. That's, that, that's what we do. We get into the word of God and we talk about what the text actually says. We deal with what the text actually says so that we get a better understanding of the word of God. In addition to that, we talk about the, uh, the apologetics, if you will, about these particular texts. And I'm honest about the research that is out there. And I get it. There are people out there that don't like the Bible, but don't come up in here throwing out some ideology and you don't have any, any evidence to support your rejection of when these documents are written. I'll give you the controversy that surrounds first and second Peter. I'm cool with that. You want to talk about that? I'm I'm cool with that. You want to talk about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and say, well, those were written 50 as late as 60 years later. I'm cool with that. But you can't say that about seven of Paul's 13 letters. It is impossible to make that statement because it has been confirmed that seven of Paul's 13 letters are actually written by him, and they are written as early as 15 years after the resurrection. And that is confirmed by atheist scholars. Woo, boy, talk to me. Let's get back to the text. Verse 14 of Galatians chapter two, chapter. Three, he says, he redeemed us in order that what the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through whom? Through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive what? The promise of the Spirit. What is Paul getting at? Paul is getting at the realities that are found in Christ. He's getting at the realities of faith in Christ. Wow, very, very powerful. He redeemed us. How did he redeem us? By becoming a curse. It's as cursed as everyone who hangs on a pole. And as we celebrate Good Friday, it is this day that Christ was hung on a pole. And it's on this day that God redeemed us by Christ becoming a curse. Very powerful. We were under a curse and, and Christ became a curse that we may be redeemed. It is by the blood of Christ that we are redeemed. Faith in that, not by works of the law. Very, very powerful. Verse 15 of Galatians chapter 3. Hey, we're here every morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. This is where we get into the word. If you're a guest, I want to welcome you. You are an honored guest. I'm thankful that you are here. Welcome. If you like what you're hearing, if you're encouraged, go ahead and click to follow. If I have encouraged you and given you insight into the text, click to follow. If I haven't, don't click to follow. I'm cool with that. But if you have gone, wow, this is insightful. This is helpful. Click to follow. Wow, that encourages me. Why, why do I need encouragement? Because if there are people out there that like this content, guess what? I'm going to be here. I am going to be here. That's what I'm going to do. First time, Tara, welcome. Come on, Tara. Come on. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is a place where we get into the word. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad you clicked the follow. We're here every morning, 7 a.m. If you missed it, go to the link in the bio. And guess what? You can get caught up on everything that we've done since July of last year. All right, let's get to it. Galatians chapter 3, verse 15. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. So what is he doing here? He's taking an example from everyday life. Uh, just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. So he's talking about covenants. He's talking about promises, basically contracts. He says, verse 16, the promise were uh, uh, the promises were spoken to who? Abraham and to what? His seed. Now watch what he says here. He says, the scripture does not say, and to seed. So the plurality, plurality of the text actually means something. He says, it says to Abraham and his seed. So what is he getting at? G Genesis chapter 17, 
Uh, verse 19, it says, then God said, yes, but your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son. You will uh, you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. So he talks about the covenant promise, right? He talks about that. The Lord in Psalms 132, he talks about what God had promised. He says, the Lord swore an oath to David, a sure oath. Uh, he will not revoke one of your descendants I will place on your throne. Well, what does he say in Psalms 132? One, one seed, one individual will be placed on your throne. Wow. Very, very powerful. He lists. So all of this is coming from Old Testament texts. And he's saying not many, right? But one. Well, what is he saying? And to your seed, many, meaning one person who is what? Christ. Paul is saying that this one person, this one seed was a prophecy of Christ. That when God instituted this covenant with Abraham, the covenant was a promise that through this one, this birth of Isaac, through this son that you have, there will come one seed that will bless all nations. That's both Jew and Gentile. Very powerful. God started this with Abraham that predates the law. Do you understand? Wow. This, this is... This is very powerful. And why is he bringing this forward? Because he's trying to help these Gentile Christians to understand that God's promises superseded the law. They predated the law. And everything was a promise about the coming of Christ. That that is the fulfillment of all things. And that is where we place our faith. Verse 17, what I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later, later than Abraham. So in other words, you get Abraham, and then 430 years later, the law was introduced. It says, does not set aside the covenant previously established by God, and thus do away with the promise. So what is he saying? He's saying, Abraham, when God made that promise to Abraham, that was 430 years prior to Moses, 430 years prior to Moses. And when Moses came, Moses introduced the law. And he said, but God had already made a promise about what he was doing to Abraham that was 400 years before Moses was even born. Wow. So what is he getting at? that when Moses came, it did not supersede or it did not nullify the covenant or the promise that God had made to Abraham. It says it does not set aside what the covenant previously established by God and those uh, thus do away with the promise. Verse 18, for if the inheritance depend, depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. So what is he saying? He's saying, look, if it depends on the law, then it doesn't depend on the promise of God. It depends on something different. And he's he's contrasting God's promise versus a the law. It, it, he's like, no, no, it never supersedes God's promise. And then he says, why then? Verse 19. And this is where you get an understanding of why the law was introduced, right? Well, why was the law introduced then if this was all about God's promise? And because that's the question that people are asking. And so you go uh, right to verse, what is this? Verse 19, it says, why then was the law given at all, right? Because that's the question. If the law is under a curse, if the law doesn't bring righteousness, if the law doesn't um, uh, bring justification, why was the law given at all? It was added because of what? Transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given, now watch this, the law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, 
but God is one. So why was the law introduced? Because this is the question. The law was introduced because of what? Transgressions. Well, what was happening? People were living out of control. You know, God had made a promise, and God's promise was, was not about, um, uh, well, you're just going to be awesome and perfect, and you're not going to sin. Um, you're you're going to be ho holy in a, in, in, a, in a sense of never sinning again. No, God's promise was, these people are sinful. And my promise to you is that I'm going to bring grace and forgiveness to you. The promise was about reconciliation. The promise was about God justifying our sinful behavior, God forgiving uh, and, and reconciling us. The promise was not about you're never going to sin again. The promise was about the good news that God is going to forgive you of your sin. It, it, and But what was happening 400 years, 430 years in the making of that promise from Abraham to Moses, people were living out of control. Idolatry was getting out of control. Selfishness, murder. Think about Moses. Why did he leave Egypt? Because he killed a man. He beat a man to death. I mean, do you, do you know? I mean, this was crazy. Slavery was out of control. Um, uh, uh, polygamy was out of control. Uh, the violence of people, um, um, sacrifice, sufficing of children, it was out of control. And God is saying, I want to bring forth forgiveness for people that are out of control. But the transgressions of people are just getting so overwhelming. I've got to get something that is going to manage the transgressions of mankind until the seed. And here we have verse 19. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of what? Transgressions. Man was out of control until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. God was saying, I got to do something to control this out of control behavior until the seed, because the seed, the son, is going to bring what? Forgiveness. Wow. Very, very powerful. And then watch what he says. The law was given through whom? Angels. So angels had to come and institute some things uh, to, to manage the transgressions of mankind until the seed. Wow, very powerful. Verse 21, is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. The law was not uh, opposed to God. It, it wasn't. Absolutely not. For if the law had been given uh, that could impart life, then righteousness certainly would have come from the law. But the scriptures has locked up everything under the control of sin. So that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus, might be given to those who believe. So what is he getting at here? So he gets back to the law, and what does he say? He says, the law, therefore, opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. The law was not opposed to God. But the law did not fulfill what God's promises were. He says, for if the law had been given, uh, could impart what? Life? then righteousness certainly could have come from the law. But what is he saying? Righteousness doesn't come from the law. You know, you look at uh, people that are law keepers. They, they equate what they're doing and their behavior with compliance to the law as righteousness. And Paul says, no. This righteousness or this reconciliation does not come from the law. It just doesn't. You know, it, it, it really doesn't. And 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 this is this is a powerful statement uh, to embrace. So again, when 
critics want to pull up Leviticus chapter 25 or they want to talk about the law. I, I'm just going to speak what Paul says. Righteousness couldn't be gained from the law. That's not righteous. Angels instituted that. It was just something to mitigate a very sinful people under a curse until the time of Christ. That is why. It is it that that is the reason I respond to that because it says it right here. Don't be ashamed of what Paul discourses on this issue. So when people bring up slavery, when they bring up um, polygamy and all those things, it, it, this this text tells you that it was it was for a sinful people and it never produced righteousness. It's not moral. The law did not bring out moral integrity. It just, it never did. But why do people want to say that? Because they don't know their Bible. They do not know the Bible. And what they're doing is looking for verses or passages or sections of the Bible that uh, support a narrative of rejection, rather than looking to see what the Bible actually says. And when you read what the Bible actually says, you get clarity on complex, difficult situations. And God gives you answers. And it's very powerful. But the scriptures, uh, uh, what does it say in verse 22? But the scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Wow. I, you know, when I read this, I just go, man, this is this is just incredible. This um, this is powerful. And, 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 and listen, um, I get what, um, what happens. People find things in the Old Testament or in the law and, and they have a, a good reason for certain things. And they have a, an appearance of something that is awesome, but that appearance of awesomeness, that appearance of devotion is a self-inflicted one. In other words, because I am doing this, I am good. Because I am exercising this type of behavior, I am therefore holy. Where in Christ, it's like, no, I'm a mess. Because of what Christ did, I am holy. What Christ did, I am seen as forgiven. It, you know, one relies on an individual's effort and energy, and the other relies on Christ. And that's the power of faith in Christ. That's the power of entrusting myself to Christ because he became the curse that we may have life. Wow. I'm going to end here. Uh, that is inspiring to me. Now, listen, if you like what you heard, like and subscribe. We do this every day, 7 a.m. I'm here as long as God enables me. Uh, Come on, uh, 